With war now escalating in Ukraine, people are wondering whether or not Bitcoin is a safe haven asset to go to. Well, the performance has indicated otherwise, but we'll make that discussion here with Alex Mashinsky, CEO of Celsius Network. Alex, let's talk about this. Welcome back. Hi, David. Thanks for having me back. Okay. The argument here is that Bitcoin is digital gold. This is something that a lot of people have been saying for years. It's not behaving like gold right now. Gold is up and Bitcoin's down today. In fact, I'm looking at the charts. We're at $35,000, $36,000. It's been trending down for, for, for months, of course. But recently, the escalations in Eastern Europe have not helped Bitcoin's cause. Why has Bitcoin not performed well in spite of rising risks of war that's been brewing for weeks? Yeah, so definitely, I think uh, uh, Bitcoin is not... Uh, uh, detach itself from uh, the main markets, right? If you think about uh, the stock market, uh, uh, if you think about a man walking his dog, right? This pup and uh, the pup is on a leash, the pup is trying to break out and run away. Uh, uh, and the pup is Bitcoin and the, the man walking is the stock market. Uh, the stock market still controls uh, Bitcoin, right? And until we see a decoupling uh, or see the pub break away, uh, uh, we, we're going to see those two markets go together. The marginal buyer or seller of Bitcoin is the same person trading Tesla or trading uh, Apple or other things. And so basically the institutions and the hodlers in the crypto community are not the one dictating the price, but the, the marginal buyer or seller uh, and there are just too many of those people. There, you don't have that institutional support that you have in traditional markets. So I think it might take another uh, few years for us to see that decoupling. Uh, but uh, when we see it, uh, you're basically going to start seeing that uh, Bitcoin behaving as a safety asset rather than the, the correlated asset to the stock market. I wonder what uh, the Bitcoin or other crypto uh, trading volume on your own platform Celsius has been like over the last few days, last few weeks, over the last 24 hours in particular. I would imagine, again, maybe I'm wrong, I would imagine that people are flocking to cryptos and DeFi now, Bitcoin in particular, because because it, this this war is a good advertisement for adoption, right? You, you, if, you're, if you're in the Ukraine and you want to flee Kiev and you can't bring a bunch of gold with you, maybe you're concerned about your assets being frozen in your banks, you can just put your money in a, in a USB in a cold wallet and leave, and you would still have your wealth with you. Is that happening right now? Are people doing that? Yeah, so Celsius is a, uh, a hodlers platform. It's a platform where people are mostly savers, we're not a trading platform yes. and uh, we do see an increase uh, like you said we see an increase in assets uh, mostly from younger people uh, when we launched the platform four years ago our 18 to 34 uh, uh, age range was about 25 percent of the population now it's over 50 percent of our users so it's definitely getting younger and uh, getting more international where more and more people overseas are picking up uh, uh, more crypto and see that as their uh, savings uh, platform. But for trading purposes, you can you can look at exchanges and you can see a lot of that volume uh, uh, basically increasing as you see migration of, again, uh, traders leaving and institutions uh, coming in, young people coming in and replacing them. Let's talk about the market outlook then. So going back to what you said about Bitcoin being still linked to the broader equity markets, let's run with that assumption and assume that they're running in parallel. So we'll talk about the broader market's reaction to what's going on in, in Eastern Europe. Now, I know you're, you were born in the Ukraine, so this is probably a very personal issue for you. Uh, what do you think is uh, Russia's objective right now? And what do you think is going to happen over the next couple of weeks? And then we'll link that to markets. Yeah, so obviously Putin is now uh, just trying to prepare his legacy, right? He's worried uh, or he's planning to reunite the, the Russia that he knew when he was a KGB officer, the USSR. I was born uh, when uh, Ukraine was part of the USSR. And uh, he's, not, he's willing to sacrifice lives. He's willing to go and change regimes for that. And that's what we're seeing right now happening in the Ukraine. Unfortunately, the West is not willing to commit people on the ground. They're only willing to commit economic, uh, you know, sanctions on yeah. Russia. And, uh, but I think what's going to come out of this is that uh, the West is going to unite. 
uh, because of these actions. Uh, pe- countries that thought that they could run on their own are going to realize that they need the, the West and especially, especially the United States much more than they thought before. And because of that, you will see strengthening of the dollar and you effectively seeing an extension of the empire, the United States empire and the US dollar as the reserve currency of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, these events are empowering the West, empowering the United States. And uh, all that is obviously good for America. I'm going to come back to that statement. That was a very important point. You just made the strength of the dollar. Okay, uh, I'm reading headlines everywhere. Why are sanctions not working? P- uh, Biden threatened sanctions yesterday or two days ago when, uh, when uh, Putin announced the uh, recognition of two breakaway uh, regions in eastern Ukraine, yet he still moved into Kiev. Why did sanctions not deter Putin from invasion? Well, uh, Putin's source of power is high energy prices. And uh, until we deal with that, until we actually create more energy, either by uh, uh, creating a safe uh, nuclear power, by putting more renewables, by allowing drilling and, and other types of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels, uh, we are effectively not going to uh, solve the problem. And, mm-hmm. and uh, the Ukraine is just the first country. Uh, I just to remind everybody that, uh, you know, Hitler also tried to unite all the German people and invaded several countries with exactly the same argument that Putin is doing in the Ukraine. So if we want to solve the Putin problem, we need to lower energy prices. And to do that, we need to basically uh, allow much more competition, allow much more development of different energy sources that will bring down the price of oil. There's a big green movement going on in the US. You're obviously aware of this. It's difficult to uh, convince, I guess there's a lot of lobby groups going on, but I guess it's difficult to convince industry that now is a good time to increase their shale and fracking production, right? Or or, or is that still gonna happen? Well, I I think a lot of those people are gonna revisit their assumption after seeing what happened here. And, And I'm all for a green planet. Uh, yeah. Celsius is an example. Our, all of our mining sure. is carbon sure. neutral and, uh, and so on. So the two do not have to be in conflict. And uh, uh, I'm all for uh, uh, carbon neutral energy production. And there's many, many technologies that enable you to do that. But until we have enough of that carbon neutral production, we cannot shut down or eliminate uh, the traditional sources because what happens is that we're empowering dictators uh, to do uh, their bidding. And obviously the consequences of that are gonna be tens of thousands of people dead all over the world. Uh, one more geopolitical issue, and we'll move on to uh, markets. Uh, people are saying now that because Russia has gone basically into Ukraine without any opposition and, uh, and, and pushback from the West militarily, China is next. China is watching this situation very closely and perhaps can be emboldened by the West's lack of action. And now China could be possibly eyeing Taiwan as a target for invasion in the coming years because the West is doing nothing about Ukraine. Is this something that you're watching for? Well, I don't think, first, uh, the United States did not have a treaty with uh, the Ukraine to defend the Ukraine. The Ukraine was not part of the NATO, uh, but the U.S. does have a treaty with NATO, uh, with uh, Taiwan. So, uh, so I do think that those are two very different situations. Also, uh, China is much more reliant on the West uh, in terms of exports, in terms of financing, in terms of uh, a, a cooperation. Russia is actually much less reliant on the West, so uh, uh, sanctions uh, work much better on China than they work on Russia. So because of all these things, I don't see uh, China taking uh, the next step and invading Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But the fact that uh, Putin uh, uh, flew and met with uh, uh, the uh, leaders of China uh, before he decided to make this invasion, tells me that he did coordinate with China to make sure that uh, China is one of the largest users of natural gas and of uh, 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 oil uh, from Russia. And he wanted, they they recently, I think a year or two ago, signed a $400 billion deal to supply uh, oil for 20 years. Uh, And uh, I'm sure that uh, he cleared his invasion with China before he, uh, he, he pressed that button. 
No, that's an excellent point. I'm just reading articles. For example, this headline from Reuters, China rejects calling Russia's move an invasion, urges its citizens in Ukraine to stay home. So China is taking Russia's side on this issue. Let's, let's link this back to the market. So you're, you're talking about maybe a shift in regime in the Ukraine, maybe a prolonged conflict over the next couple of weeks. How do you think the stocks uh, in the U.S. And, uh, and abroad are going to react to this? So we've seen basically that all of this is already priced in. Uh, this morning, uh, 7 a.m., uh, the, the indexes were down. I think the Dow was down 800 points. And obviously, uh, we recovered most of that during the day. And that tells you that the stock market already accepts uh, uh, the, the overthrow of the regime in the Ukraine as a fait accompli. And uh, because of that, uh, I don't see uh, the rest of this uh, cascading of events in the Ukraine as having any additional impact. So I do expect the, the price of Bitcoin and the stock market indexes uh, mm -hmm. to have seen the lows at uh, around 6 or 7 a.m. this morning. Now, those will be the lows to measure against uh, for the next few months. Bitcoin. And none okay. of, yeah, none, none of these... Uh, 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 the conflict doesn't really affect Apple or Google or any of the companies that are leading the charts uh, uh, in the stock market. And because of that, I think uh, we've seen the bottoms. Well, what about uh, Fed response or central bank response, ECB, Federal Reserve, Bank of England? How are they going to respond? There's, there's, there's economic impacts in Eastern Europe. Are they, is, that, is, that, is that conflict going to affect the U.S. and the West, you think? In terms of economic growth, yes. So, so, so central banks uh, got very concerned about inflation. They kept telling us inflation is transitory, and then yes. uh, they realized that maybe it's not, and they were basically trying to slow down the economy. Well, Russia just slowed down the world's economy, right? Anyone who was thinking of taking large risks, any business how did manager, it do that? Or CEO, sorry, how, how did how did Russia slow down the world economy? So. But by invading the U Ukraine, Russia effectively uh, put at risk or the created a lot of uncertainty uh, with global activity, meaning every CEO of every company now has to think about, well, what if Russia invades another country? What if mm -hmm. Russia uh, uh, is, is in a prolonged war in the Ukraine and the U.S. has to intervene or the NATO has to intervene and so on? So all these things create uncertainty. Uh, they create less willingness of banks and financial institutions to lend. That slows down the world's economy. And that's exactly what the Fed and other countries, uh, central bank, were trying to achieve. They thought that we were running too hot, Got right? It. And that's why they're going to raise rates. So it doesn't mean they're not going to raise rates. It just means that instead of seven raises that we were expecting, many were expecting this year, we're probably now down to three or four raises, which is going to get us to that one and a half to two percent level. Uh, and the Fed is probably going to stop there instead of going right. higher. Let me give you a counter idea, Alex. Uh, let me see if you, uh, let's see if you agree or disagree with this. Russia's invasion of Ukraine could uh, push energy prices up even higher, above $100 a barrel for oil. Uh, that might in turn make inflation go higher, which is going to prompt the Fed to raise rates more quickly because if inflation doesn't go down from 7.5%, if energy goes up, inflation goes up to 8 or 9%, they have to raise rates, right? So, uh, oil is a much more uh, uh, flexible commodity, meaning uh, Saudi Arabia can add uh, 2 million barrels mm -hmm. uh, pretty easily if they wanted to. The United States can add uh, 2 million barrels if they wanted to. Uh, remember, when we start, stopped fracking, when we stopped exploring, uh, we capped all those wells, right? It's not like yeah. we basically buried all of that, right? So, so we can actually bring back a lot of more production, which already is happening with, uh, you know, the, the old saying, the, the cure for high oil prices are high oil prices. So uh, we're there right now. And uh, uh, I think the United States should uh, release some of the petroleum reserves that we have to basically put a lot of pressure on Russia uh, in a massive way, right? We should release uh, maybe 100 million barrels or something like that just to uh, show Putin that we can hurt him uh, where it hurts the most. And uh, unfortunately, again, we, we work, we're looking at sanctions instead of looking at curing the source of all this evil 
which is high oil prices. Let's go back to Bitcoin. You mentioned something very important to me earlier that this whole situation is going to shed light on the strength in the West and perhaps bring the West together, which is good for the dollar. We can expect a strengthening of the U.S. dollar. How is that going to affect Bitcoin? People are talking about the U.S. dollar potentially competing with Bitcoin as reserve currencies. Down the line, if the dollar strengthens, would that be bad for Bitcoin? Well, I, I don't really agree with the people that think that... Uh... Bitcoin competes with the dollar. Uh, mm -hmm. Bitcoin has its own adoption curve. Uh, it, 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 the number of people uh, adding or exploring or joining Bitcoin uh, uh, is increasing every day. And it's just going to take uh, a long time for the crypto community to get to a billion people. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Yes. But the fact that you have, you have capped supply, there's never going to be more than 21 million Bitcoin, and you have growing demand, basically tells you that over a long period of time, the price of Bitcoin is going to increase. So if right now uh, the prices are low at $35,000, that's a great time to average in and add to your position. That's what I'm doing. And uh, you just have to be patient. And over time, the price of Bitcoin will increase uh, because more and more people are going to use it. Okay, and uh, just going back to the price, you you mentioned that this is possibly the the bottom for us, thirty five, thirty six thousand dollars. Yes, I think for this conflict, uh, this is the bottom. Uh, we have very strong support at that thirty thousand level. I think I was at your show uh, just a few months ago when we were uh, uh, there, and you were asking me if we're going to go much lower, and I said that I think we're going to hold the twenty nine to thirty thousand levels, and I think today we're going to hold. Mm. Uh, the current levels and go higher uh, because again all the people that were on leverage got flushed out all the traders who wanted to get out considering the bad news already sold yeah crypto does not have a, uh, as much leverage as people think when those pe when those people sell there's only buyers who are left and that's where prices will go higher okay all right let's talk about celsius and DeFi. Uh, you recently launched celsius x uh, tell us about that yeah, so uh, Celsius became famous for building a bridge between TradFi, traditional finance, and CFI, right? We basically made it really easy for people to open a wallet, uh, um, transfer their assets, earn yield, take a loan. And now we're building the second part. We're building a bridge. We just launched a bridge between uh, uh, the CFI part of Celsius and DeFi, the whole DeFi mm -hmm. world. So Celsius X. That IO is the website if you want to learn more about it. And basically what we provide is the ability to unite uh, many, many different blockchains and take any asset that, for example, Bitcoin only operates on the Bitcoin blockchain. We can now enable it to run on Polygon, to run on Ethereum, to run on Cardano and so on, which unites the pools of liquidity across all the different blockchains. So instead of uh, isolated uh, blockchains, now we, we pull them all together, we connect them all together and provide liquidity uh, across different blockchains. And uh, you told me offline, you recently uh, recruited the former CFO of Royal Bank of Canada, one of Canada's largest banks by assets. So congratulations, tell us about that move. You're clearly expanding into de new demographics, right? Yeah, so it, it was great. Again, if you wanna build this uh, really big bridge from TradFi to CFI, you need people from CFI and DeFi, and you need people from TradFi. So Rod, who joined us uh, recently, uh, uh, also follows uh, uh, other top executives that we brought in from City wow. and other institutions. And uh, together, I think Celsius has the strongest team in uh, in crypto, and we plan to use that to build these bridges and uh, make it much more safe and much more uh, palatable for people to deploy their assets in the crypto community. Are you not concerned about competition from, not now, but down the line competition from tr tr traditional finance, uh, like Royal Bank, for example, because they're probably thinking, okay, we're losing our top executives to Alex Mashinsky, and not just you, but a lot of, uh, a lot of DeFi firms are now recruiting from TradFi. And so they're probably thinking, okay, it's time to make inroads into cryptos. Let's not live in the past. A lot of investment banks are now trading cryptos, but let's open up platforms like Celsius. They have the infrastructure to do that. They're not doing it currently, but in the future they could, right? Yeah, I, I, look, I think the banks have very uh, profitable franchises and uh, it's gonna take them uh, quite some time to 
basically uh, lean on crypto. I think crypto today is too small of an asset class uh, mm -hmm. to really make an impact for Royal Bank of Canada or yeah. JP Morgan or any of the other big guys. So while they look at it as a threat, they're not yet look, seeing it as an opportunity. And I think it's going to take a few more years for them to see it as an opportunity as the asset class grows. And then we hope to be their partner because uh, these are uh, muddy waters. It's not easy to just jump into crypto and you're going to need to have a good partner and guess who they're going to call uh, when they're looking for a partner. They're going to call people they know, people that they can trust. And there's very few pe people like that right now uh, in the crypto community. Final question, I'll let you go. Uh, I'm not, I always ask you for a price prediction. I'm going to frame the question a little bit differently today. Uh, I'm getting the sense from the crypto crowd that sentiment right now is a little bit poor compared to last year. Headlines like this, for example, on CNBC, next Bitcoin bull run won't happen until end of 2024, says top crypto exchange co-founder. This is uh, Du Zhang, co-founder of cryptocurrency exchange uh, Huobi. H uh, H U O uh, B I. So the, the people, even in the crypto space, are skeptical of an immediate bull run. They're saying this is going to stall for the next two years. But this guy's saying 2024. What's your sentiment like? So again, Celsius is not an exchange, and I can tell you that we have a very fast-growing community. Yeah, our community just keeps adding assets. Uh, they're not selling, uh, and uh, people on exchanges might be selling, but people at Celsius are buying more and more coins. So uh, from my uh, point of view, for, from representing a million and a half uh, uh, Celsians who hold almost 20 billion in assets, I can tell you that I completely disagree with what he is saying. Okay, okay, so we'll expect a bull run sooner rather than later. Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, we'll have you back on to follow up uh, on what Bitcoin's doing over the next couple of weeks. Should be interesting, thank you. Thanks, David. And thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lynn.